when you have issues in family law, it's super stressful. And so hopefully, um, I'm hoping that this will be a space that helps people reduce the stress and get a little bit more understanding. And in the end, it's going to make our job easier as lawyers because you know, people will be better educated about things and we don't have to spend our time that they're paying for to explain the basics. Welcome to Access to Justice. I am Evan Clark from the Cahane Law Office. I'm joined today by, by my co-host, Evan Mallard from Merrick Law, and a special guest, Kim McDonald from McDonald Advisory and Raymond James Limited. How are you guys doing? Good, Evan. How are you? I'm well, thanks. Good. How about you, Kim? I think spring is in the air, Evan. I'm pretty excited about it. Yeah, I'm excited as well. <laughs> so I thought it would be a good place to start with um, just introduce yourselves and I'll introduce myself as well because um, I'd just like to know a little bit more about you. So why don't we start with you, Kim? What's your background? Um, so again, my name is Kim McDonald and I'm a financial advisor and insurance advisor with McDonald Advisory at Raymond James LTD. So we are an investment firm and we also have a whole host of wealth management um, uh, things that we do for our clients. So I'm happy to be on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. And we're excited to have you. And Heather, how about you? What brought you to this point right now? <laughs> today, this morning? Uh... Well, I'm Heather Mallorick. I am in my lucky 13th year of practice um, as a lawyer, and I'm practicing exclusively family law. And I uh, had a bit of a journey, I guess. Um, I've done all sorts of family law work for legal aid. I was a partner in a law firm, and now I'm operating a solo practice as Merrick Law. And um, I think what brought um, all three of us together was helping to share legal information with the public in a way that's really accessible and approachable. And I think that's how we got connected. What brings you here today, Evan? Um, well, I'm a relatively new lawyer. So I was called to the bar back in 2018. And, uh, but before I went to law school and before I started university, I, uh, I spent 10 years doing other stuff after uh, graduating from high school. It's not the normal route that people take, but, um, and since becoming a lawyer, uh, I worked at a small firm and then as COVID hit, uh, things were tough for that small firm out in rural Alberta. And I ended up opening my own firm in association with Kahane Law, who are located down in Calgary. I am their Edmonton office. Um, and I don't practice exclusively in family law, but I do practice a lot of family law. And it's probably about 60 to 70% of my practice. And I do also a little bit in corporate, small business type stuff and um, estate planning and a little bit of civil litigation. And I found uh, as I've been, you know, dealing with clients and, and um, educating my own clients and talking to lots of people who give our firm a call, I found that there's just such a gap in knowledge and um, and we're not talking about like, I'm not talking about like deep legal stuff mm -hmm. and like getting deep in like a law school class type knowledge. I'm talking about what are the rules? What are, what are the, the kind of the set things about family law, like child support, spousal support, how does that work? And, and generally there's so much misinformation people hear from their buddy who got divorced, um, you know, and tells them something and then, it's usually something scary. <laughs> right. Or expensive or both. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, there's just, I, I see um, that there's just a huge gap that I think can be filled. Mm. And I'm hoping that this will help fill that gap of just being informative, helping people understand what their rights and responsibilities are, not just with family law, but certainly family law, because that's it. That's an area that um, it's very prevalent. People have issues there and, um, when you have issues in family law, it's super stressful. And so hopefully, um, I'm hoping that this will be a space that helps people reduce the stress and get a little bit more understanding. And in the end, it's going to make our job easier as lawyers because 
you know, people will be better educated about things that we don't have to spend our time that they're paying for to explain the basics. So, sure. um, now, how did you guys, well, actually first, Heather, why don't you tell people about how we met? So, Evan, you and I met because um, we are both part of a, how do you describe that? Like a, 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 ch a website, is it a list serve? Like, do those even exist anymore? <laughs> well, uh, it's like a website resource for lawyers. For lawyers. By, by Kent Proudman. For family lawyers, family counsel dot CA. I hope I can give that a shout out because it's yeah, just sure. uh, a great resource for family lawyers. Um, but Evan, you'd posted about um, legal tech, basically, um, and I was switching um, firms at that time. So I reached out to you, and we had a, a chat about legal tech and practice and business and and that kind of stuff. And A kind of led to B. Um, being here today, you shared with me that you were um, doing some videos to share with the public and to get some information out there. Yeah. And then you and Kim had already kind of started something. And then one, one thing led to another. And we thought, let's join forces and see if we can't do something even better than what we were doing on our own. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty excited to be a part of this as a younger lawyer to be involved with both of you um, is great. Uh, and so, Kim, how did you and Heather meet? <laughs> so I I sort of fell into family law in, in an accidental way. I had some clients who were getting divorced. I didn't really understand what was happening, and they were asking questions that I didn't have the answers to. And I thought, well, maybe there's something I can do to be able to give them good advice, whether it's just finding lawyers to refer them to, or uh, maybe there's something on the financial services side that I can do to maybe cut down some costs for them. So I started writing exams that chartered financial divorce, what is it? Chartered financial divorce analyst and certified divorce financial specialist, or it's something like that. There's these two fairly comprehensive exams that you could write in Canada, and uh, they are everything to do with the uh, divorce and separation process and how it interfaces with the financial services. So it was really interesting. And I started thinking, wow, this is a lot of information that would have helped me in, you know, the last 15 years of my career. Mm -hmm. So I was poking around on the internet trying to figure out what this collaborative law thing was that kept popping up in my textbooks. And I found the association in Alberta and reached out and asked them if they had financial services professionals. And they said they didn't have very many of them. And they were very welcoming for me to join the group, which meant a lot of courses and a lot of time spent with family lawyers in in various um, various rooms around Edmonton and, and Calgary. So Heather and I had met on the mediation course, which is a requirement to be a collaborative professional, which both Heather and I are. So the mediation is a full one week course where we learn what we need to know uh, to to work people through a, a true mediation. Mediation. And I was just, you know, like every time I go into these meetings with the lawyers, like I just learned so much and I'm so amazed at the their skill level with conversation and, and communication. And um, I remember meeting Heather in the mediation class. There was, I don't know, probably 40 probably 40 lawyers, maybe a couple people in the financial services, a couple uh, mental health specialists, but primarily lawyers. And Heather was a friendly face in the room and we got to know each other. So I'll let Heather finish the story. Yeah. Well, it was, uh, it was sort of a lockdown situation too, because we were in a hotel, tons of, um, uh, full day programming and then homework after that and lots of role playing, which I think always shoves everybody out of their comfort zone a little bit, but also means that, you know, I think you bond a little bit too. So, um, I, uh, had a bus ticket booked for the drive home and it was snowy and we, um, I think all gratefully got to leave a little early and Kim offered me a ride home. So I think you and I really, um, cemented our friendship on that drive home talking about uh, sort of this that and everything um 
And uh, we kind of somehow blundered upon this idea of saying, you know, I learned so much from you and from the mental health professionals. And you felt like you'd learned so much from us that maybe somehow we could like get together and, and share the information that we have, but hopefully get some information from all the people out there that know all about the stuff that we don't know about and share that in a way um, that makes or that's easy and um, accessible for people. So nice. And so you're talking about this collaborative law thing. I'm sure you're not the only one, Kim, that's like come across collaborative law and wondered what exactly does that mean? <laughs> and it's a thing. It's not just like lawyers collaborating ad hoc. It's it's a real thing mm -hmm. uh, that is, uh, you know, you've got to do this kind of training in order to be able to be a collaborative law professional. So. What is collaborative law? Who wants to start first? Like, just explain what it is. Sure, I can. I can, I can take that question, Evan. Um, sometimes lawyers say there's like small C collaborative and big C collaborative. So I think what we're talking about is big C collaborative, like being a registered collaborative um, family professional. So you have to do the education requirements and be registered as a collaborative professional. But essentially what it boils down to is that we all follow the same process to help families resolve their um, the, the issues that need to be resolved when there's a breakdown in the relationship. Um, and the hallmark of the process is at the very beginning, uh, both parties agree that they're not going to take their issues to court. So what that, um, and that they're going to sit down with their lawyers at a series of four-way meetings to use interest-based negotiation to try and resolve all of the issues that um, need to be resolved in order for them to um, get a divorce judgment or a separation agreement or whatever the, the sort of legal uh, bow that needs to be tied off for that to happen. Um, so... Yeah, that's that's it in a nutshell. And then we just follow a very um, sort of set out process um, to achieve that goal. Um, along the way, we um, will tie in other professionals or sometimes the files come to us from a professional like Kim, who's had a client sitting at her desk saying, I'm separating and I need some help. Um, to help give their expertise in those areas that we're not trained in. So we know the law as lawyers, obviously, but Kim has an incredible fountain of knowledge about finances that I, I couldn't hope to achieve in, in, uh, in my career. And um, we also bring in mental health professionals um, to either provide support to either or both of the parties or to educate the family about their children and how to ensure that the kids are staying at the center of their conversations. So I'm going to try and summarize, and then you can tell me if I've yeah. got the summary right and yeah. correct me if I'm wrong. So <laughs> what I understand is, it's a process that um, when you're getting a divorce or going to a separation that the parties can agree they're not going to go to court. They're going to use this collaborative process and um, they go through a series of meetings where they work out the issues that they need to agree on to come up with, you know, in the end, an agreement that helps them move forward with the divorce collaboratively. Right. And then... Um, Sometimes that process is going to need to involve people besides lawyers because we're just, we're experts on the law and we can help people negotiate, but lawyers are not the same thing as psychologists or psychiatrists or financial professionals. Yeah. And so sometimes those people, uh, those different professions need to be brought in to help solve specific issues of, of the process. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. I think you nailed it. So, Kim, what has your experience been like um, participating in that process? Well, the entire thing has been eye-opening for me. I, I didn't know anything about divorce and separation other than what a typical person would know before I got involved. And when I learned that, that divorce involved a legal aspect a financial services aspect and a mental health aspect, 
it was really interesting to me to start to put those those items together because my assumptions was that when people divorced, it was the lawyer that knew everything. They were experts in finance. They were experts in, in, in everything, and they would just solve all the problems. And I hadn't spent too much time thinking about it, but once I got involved, I was... You know, I was blown away. I'm like, of course we would have other professionals involved. We would have chartered business valuators and lenders, and we would have accountants and uh, different types of mental health professionals all lending a hand because we can't specialize in everything and, and nobody's got a monopoly on a good idea. So the more the more brains that you can bring into the operation, the 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 better the process um, might work out. So I, I thought, wow, this is really interesting. Why aren't financial people involved in this process? Why am I just learning about this now after 15 years of being in the financial services and dedicating all my time to studying and writing exams? Like, why aren't we, why don't we know this? Why aren't we a piece of this, this puzzle? And that's what I've been starting to learn over the years as I've been involved in different cases and, and, and divorce files that they're, we aren't always needed, but sometimes it can be really, really helpful to people to bring us into that process, whether it's doing a budget for somebody, whether it's teaching them a little bit about what their current financial circumstances are. Maybe one person in the family has been involved in the finances and the other person has trusted their partner and now they need to get up to speed really quickly. How do they make sure that they've got a voice at the table and somebody to teach them and get them up to speed um, as, as it was alluded to earlier when we were talking, you know, if we can get people educated before they get into that meeting, then there's more hope for a really, really effective meeting versus spending all the time teaching people about different you know, financial services concepts. So, so yeah, I've just been blown away with the whole process. And every time I'm in a new case or participating in a new collaborative file, I'm learning something really interesting and um, hopefully doing my part in the process to help things out and maybe reduce fees for people, that kind of thing. So that makes me, that gives me a question that I want to ask you, Kim, which is, um, it's a little bit of a sidebar here, but Often people that sell financial products, especially a life insurance mm -hmm. um, and mutual funds, mm -hmm. um, because of the way the industry has been in the past, certainly, can, sometimes people can feel like, uh, like those people can get a bad rap. Mm -hmm. And I think that comes from a perception that people that work in that industry sometimes have tunnel vision and are focused on selling a product um, as opposed to what you would hope, which is somebody looking at your situation holistically. Can you talk a little bit about mm -hmm. like your approach to how you work with your clients? Yeah, that's, that's actually a really good point you bring up. We are neutrals in this process. So that will come up a lot in, uh, if people are poking around on the internet trying to learn about collaborative law, they'll hear about neutrals that are involved in the their collaborative law file. So what happens is they need somebody who's going to come in and speak with an unbiased point of view. So you could never have your own financial advisor join in on a collaborative meeting because there would be some inherent biases built into the conversations. I would be coming in as a completely neutral party working for everybody involved in that meeting. So it, it, it is helpful in my role to, to have knowledge on um, all types of investment products, insurance products, so we can help get the questions answered on the spot. Or if somebody says, you know, I'm not sure I believe X, Y, and Z, this is what someone else has said. I can come in and say, you know, here's the facts. Here's what this thing is. Here's how it works. And I don't have a, like a person that I'm aligned with. I'm just speaking as a neutral party in that process. And I think that's a huge part of, of this because trust Trust is a hard thing to find when you're going through a separation and divorce. So how do you find professionals out there that you can trust and they're going to give you accurate information to help with, with the conversation? So thank you for bringing that up, Evan, because I think that's, that's everything. That's everything about bringing in other professionals into this process. 
that's such a good point. Like, and I, I didn't know that about it. Like I myself, I'm not a collaborative lawyer. And so I was unaware of these neutrals and exactly how you fit into the process. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, uh, that's news to me. And um, it makes a lot of sense because in my experience, a lot of the things that make a divorce expensive for people, and you complain about how much they pay their lawyers, is just mistrust and, and misunderstanding poor communication and mistrust. And it's understandable. Like you're, you're going through a relationship breakdown. The, the relationship is not in a healthy place. And so um, it's natural to distrust the other person. And even if they're acting in good faith, um, it can be a challenge to kind of accept that. And so having, I can see the value in, in that part of the process where you, and you have someone in who's not connected to either party, has no horse in the race, so to speak, mm -hmm. and can just provide the advice that, that can clear up things and help people like be reasonable and come to, you know, trust what they're hearing. But I don't think people want to be unreasonable. I think it comes down to like, they're just not sure. And they're worried about, you know, getting screwed over. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. this can help with that. But that's, mm -hmm. that's great. So Heather, yeah, how does the collaborative law process differ from the normal legal process in divorce? From the I guess what I mean by normal would be like, you know, you're not using the collaborative law process. And there's, a, I know there's, there's a whole like bunch of options there, but what's the difference? <laughs> I was going to say, that's a tough one to answer because it's kind of, the process can be a bit of, um, oh my gosh, I'm going to date myself, but it can be a bit of a Plinko board, right? Like depending on where you start and what happens next, uh, there's uh, so many sort of ways that this stuff. Price is right is still running. Oh, good. Oh, thank goodness. Okay. Oh, Drew Carey's Drew in Carey, or something, right? right? Okay, good. <laughs> um, are they still doing Plinko, though? I guess so that's the question. Anyway, um, there's a whole there's a whole bunch of different routes to get there. So um, I think one of the big ways it differs is that there's a very intentional way that we gather and share information in the collaborative law process. So if you're doing a standard litigation type of divorce, um, each party will file their pleadings, which sets out what they they want in the end from the divorce, and then from there, um, you know, financial and supporting information. Hold on, I gotta stop you yeah. there because you yeah. used the lawyer word. You said pleadings. Uh, <laughs> the court form that you file with the court that tells the court and the other person what you're asking for. So it basically says, I want a divorce. I'm looking for, um, this much time with my kids. I'd like child support, those kinds of things. So it sets out the boundaries of what you're, what you're looking for. So from there in the litigation process, you're going to be exchanging bits and pieces of information, um, uh, sometimes through a formal disclosure process, which means exchanging things like bank statements, uh, income tax returns, things like that. Um, as far as the basic information that goes about a family that's shared, that's really going to depend on the people and the lawyers involved and the process that you take. So sometimes it's amicable and it's going to go ahead with four-way meetings and negotiation. Sometimes it's going to be a number of applications because um, things are disputed. So um, you're getting information in drips and drabs sometimes. Um, sometimes you have a reluctant sharer of information. So you're going to court and trying to get orders and lists. So if, yeah, this person still hasn't provided their uh, tax returns or whatever it is, information that you want. So the collaborative process kind of flips that right around. And we start off with the information gathering at the outset. So, um, we have a conversation about what the basic situation of the family is. And then we very intentionally gather and share financial information. So all of that stuff that the law requires us to exchange with, with one another, bank statements, income tax returns, investments, um, all that kind of stuff. And we go over it together as a group so that everyone can ask questions. Everyone feels comfortable that they're on the same page and everybody knows that they have the information in 
front of them to make decisions about those things. So that's where folks like Kim um, being involved in the process really shine because she can come in and help um, manage or help with those conversations so that if there are some options that we're not sure about or the parties aren't sure about, that information isn't coming from the other lawyer. Um, it's coming from someone who's taking a very neutral um, role in the process. So Kim might come in and say, well, you could do A or B, and these are the differences. And then the parties can make a decision from, from knowing that information. Um, Whereas your traditional divorce, if there's a dispute and it can't be resolved, then you're going to a court and the court is going to make a decision um, for you based on what's been presented to them. So I guess I should point out, now's a good time to point out that, yeah. uh, like you mentioned that people, in order to start the collaborative process, they sign an agreement saying they're not going to go to court. Yeah. I just would like to point out that, of course, anybody can go to court at, at any time. They just can't do it with the collaborative lawyers that they retained and they, they would have to exit from that process. Is that right? That's correct. That's, okay. that's absolutely correct. Yeah. So, I mean, what I'm hearing sounds really great. It sounds like it's an ideal process. People agree they're going to come to an agreement and they're mm -hmm. going to cooperate mm -hmm. so that it's a fair process and they're going to use neutral parties and use lawyers that will not represent them in litigation, which means they're not going to have any kind of like there's not going to be any shotgun moments where they pull a shotgun out and point it to the head of the other party and say, well, it's this or I'm going to, I'm going to go to court. Yeah. Takes that out of the equation. It sounds like if everybody did collaborative law, divorce would be pretty smooth and great. <laughs> and so I'm assuming that the ideal situation where collaborative law works is going to be a situation where um, the parties come in, they gather all the information, that they need in order to make decisions and inform decisions about the issues. The issues being um, parenting and custody with the children, if there's children, child support, uh, spousal or partner support, mm -hmm. and then property division. Mm -hmm. And then, so get all the information they need out there and then talk about it and figure out a solution that works for them. And then at the end, they've got an agreement that works and they can finalize the divorce relatively in a straightforward way. Yeah. And you're done. That sounds so easy, doesn't it? It does. It does sound, <laughs> sounds great. So um, what are the limitations? Well, what have you seen? Like, yeah. What type of situation is, I guess, for some contrast, what kind of situation have you seen that's well suited to this process? Mm -hmm. And which type is definitely not? Mm -hmm. I think there's a sweet spot for col for the collaborative process. Um, and it's a pretty wide sweet spot, I would say, but um, there are some couples who um, would come to me and they've just got so much figured out and agreed upon between the two of them that and there's a higher level of trust is between the two of them that maybe they don't really need a full blown collaborative process. They might need um, a short meeting or a little mediation or something like that in order to resolve one or two little aspects that are still in dispute between the two of them. Um, but in those cases, you know, sometimes the collaborative process would just be like too big and cumbersome, expensive, time consuming, all of those things for those kinds of couples. Um, there's sort of the other end of the spectrum where, um, I mean, family violence or intimate partner violence is something that doesn't necessarily disqualify a, a family from using the collaborative process, but it's something that I would be very alert to in recommending that or not, um, because you don't necessarily need an equality of knowledge, um, but if there is an inequality, it needs to be able to be addressed by the process. And that kind of inequality is not often easily equalized by the process, even with right. mental health professionals or financial neutrals adding information or support along the way. So, um, 
other examples where it might not always be appropriate would be where there's like really high stakes kind of issues or very urgent issues that need to be decided. So you might be able to give it a try, but if someone is planning a move from Edmonton to Indonesia um, or something like that, where, you know, there's not, you're not going to be able to share the kids in that kind of situation. It's just not going to be practical. You might, and there's no um, middle ground. You might need a court to make a decision about that. Um, even in those cases, some couples do try collaboration and sometimes it works just sort of fleshing out the interests and figuring things out. But sometimes that's just not gonna it's not going to be the right tool for that decision kim do you hear in your circles do you hear any criticisms about the collaborative process the interesting thing about collaborative law is that i'm brought into the process for a very short period of time and it it would be you, you couldn't really mark in the collaborative process where i'm brought in it would be a different you know, spec, like along the spectrum, if an issue pops up, then I will be brought in. The way I'm brought into that meeting is by signing a participation agreement where all parties agree that I can come in, I can do the work, and I'm I'm also, you know, bound to the, the laws of privacy and, and all that good stuff. So I don't ever participate in the full process. And I also am curious how it rolls out. So when somebody, and, and I know even with the pandemic, Collaborative has been able to sort of adjust to Zoom meetings and whatnot. I'm really curious to hear from Heather what that process looks like. People contact me all the time, say, you know, what are my options? Who do I contact? And I explain to them about mediation, collaborative law, litigation, arbitration, all these types of things. But I couldn't walk them through the exact here's what you do, here's how, what you can expect, here's how many meetings that it typically takes and what it costs. So I would love to hear mm -hmm. that part from you because I only play a very small part in this whole process. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so someone would come to me and if they want to do collaborative and you know their spouse or partner wants to do collaborative, then the lawyers would get in touch. Um, if someone comes to me and they are just interested in collaborative and their spouse doesn't yet have a lawyer, then my first step might be to send an invitation to their spouse um, with some information about collaborative law and the list of lawyers who are registered collaborative professionals. Um, once there's an agreement to uh, use the collaborative process, then I do a pretty in-depth preparation meeting with the client. So um, at that point, I lay out the process of collaborative law. But what we go through is um, goals, needs, interests, and have a really in-depth conversation about that. Because when we... Um, when we engage in interest-based negotiation, what we're essentially doing is each of the parties identifies at the beginning what their goals are from the process, what their interests are, what their needs are from, uh, from the process. And we're always weighing the options and balancing the options against those interests, whether it's individual interests or mutual interests, to decide whether that's a good option or not, or something that um, the parties are going to choose. So we have that, I have that meeting with my client, the other lawyer has the same meeting with their client, and then the two lawyers speak with one another to talk about um, what some of the common ground might be, where some of the hot spots might be between the parties, and um, to just sort of get an introduction um, to the family with one another another. Then we schedule our first collaborative meeting, our first four-way. And that one, generally speaking, follows a very particular format where we review the collaborative agreement together as a group, um, usually taking turns, reading um, it out loud, and then signing it together onto the process um, with the lawyers explaining things along the way and answering any questions. 
And then sometimes we might get a little bit into um, like the major headings that are going to need to be addressed in the divorce or separation agreement. So as Evan referred to before, um, they're typically the headings of child support. You know, how are we going to separate our finances? How are we going to care for the kids? Um, how are we going to support ourselves moving forward? And then that's usually the end of the first meeting. Um, and then the subsequent meetings from there are, are tackling those issues. Um, sometimes there's an urgent issue. So we're going to get that on the schedule on, on the agenda early on and, and talk about that. Um, and then it just kind of follows naturally from there with the, the parties guiding the process of what order they um, can or need to talk about those issues along the way. Um, and then we involve the neutrals along the way um, when and where we need to. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, there's just so much fear from people. When people contact me, they, they'll, they'll find me because they'll Google finance, divorce, Edmonton. Yeah. And they'll call me and they're scared. They're scared to reach out to the lawyer. Mm -hmm. uh, they're scared about costs. They don't really know what, what the path looks like. Mm -hmm. Nobody seems to know that they have various options. Like there, there are some clearly defined routes they could take depending on their circumstances. So, yeah. so Oh yeah, just addressing that fear with people right off the bat. How do you how do you even start this? How do you start divorce? So yeah. so yeah. yeah, I think that helps. Nice. So Heather, I'll ask you the question that Kim dodged. Um <laughs> I, I didn't. Oh, she, she dodged a question. Yeah. <laughs> no, but that was a good question because that's that's important. Like, <laughs> certainly, you know, understanding the process definitely helps take the fear out of it. So it was a good question. So there's, uh, I'm I'm grateful she asked it. But Heather, have you heard any criticisms about the collaborative process? And I have a follow up for that as well. But answer that one first. Um, sure. Yeah. I mean, I think people can sometimes be frustrated. Um, the feedback sometimes is it feels slow um, sometimes. So because it's a very intentional going through the information, particularly at the outset, it can feel um, a little slow or a little laborious sometimes, although, you know, I do my best to, um, you know, get through that, but checking in and making sure that everybody at the table um, is following along because, um, as Kim alluded to earlier, sometimes you have a real difference in um, knowledge or expertise in a certain area. So while explaining how RRSP rollovers work um, might be child's play to one of the parties, you may as well be speak speaking Martian to one of the other parties. So, um, but that can be frustrating for the person that knows a lot about the topic. So that's one thing that's identified by people. I think sometimes that is frustrating. Um, and I want to hear also like yeah. any, like any criticisms, whether they're founded or not. Yeah. Yeah. That you've heard. Yeah. Um, so I, slow. I, it yeah. can be a really slow process, which slow. makes it expensive or feel expensive. It can feel expensive. I think as well. Um, I, I think I know on the website somewhere, I don't know if I can speak to this accurately or not, but generally speaking, it's similar to or less than a litigation um, divorce, um, but it can feel expensive. But I think a litigation, you, you get the same feed. I get the same feedback, ironically, from parties who are using the litigation um, process to divorce, right? They're like, how come it's not going faster? How come there's no court date for eight months from now? Why is it costing me so much money? So I mean, there is a, there's a lot of overlap in those two, sure. <laughs> in those two categories, but, but certainly there, I mean, there are legitimate concerns using either process. Um, and I guess the fact is, is divorce isn't necessarily a really simple process. There are a lot of things that need to be decided, uh, sorted out and crossed off. Uh, I mean, from, from the legal side of things. So, um, I think most lawyers do their best to make it an efficient process, um, but it is going to be a little bit slow and it's going to cost a little bit of money. And have that. you heard any criticisms that need to be debunked? Like they're just not accurate, good criticisms that you hear that kind of make you roll your eyes a little bit when you hear them. Um, 
you know, I can't think of any. Have you heard criticisms of? I'm gonna. Uh, I know I'm gonna turn the the, yeah, <laughs> the no, microphone uh, around. I, have you heard? Yeah, I'm happy to speak to like that? kind of what I've mm-hmm. heard about it. Yeah, I think part of the reason that you haven't heard much criticism is that it's just not a well understood. Like people kind of know the name, they've heard the name, mm-hmm. but people aren't familiar enough with it for there to be a bunch of criticism besides what you might hear from your your clients that mm. get unhappy, become unhappy with the process. Mm-hmm. I think we've kind of already touched on where the criticisms I've heard come from, which is uh, if you're going to, so let me start actually this with a little, I used to have a tiling business. I used to install tile and people often would be, would get a little bit impatient because at the beginning of a project, there's a lot of planning. Uh-huh. for doing tile, at least the way that my company installed it. And so they would see us come in and maybe like spend a day on fixing the floor, the subfloor. And then the next day we would come in and we'd be like snapping chalk lines and cutting, doing some cuts. Cuts take a lot of time. They can take a lot of time, especially if they're like, you know, round and stuff like this. And so there's like a couple days and like there's no tile stuck to the floor. Right. And they're like, Bro, you're taking a long time. Right. When it comes to time to actually put the tile on the floor, that's done in like a day or two, depending on the size of the floor. Right. But the planning and the foundational work that is the most important because that's going to decide how long that tile sticks to that floor mm-hmm. is takes quite a lot of time. Like sometimes you're like putting down a sub floor and stuff like this. So I guess the same thing could be said about the collaborative process is that Laying that foundation can feel slow, tedious, and you're paying your lawyer. Each of you are paying a lawyer for a four-way meeting, which is, I'm imagining somewhere between, going to be between two, three, maybe even four hours at a sitting. And when lawyers are charging by their hourly rate, that's not particularly cheap. And so I can see that. And then you, they might come away from those initial meetings feeling like, what even was accomplished here today? I feel like nothing was accomplished, right. which isn't necessarily true. So there's that whole process that may take some time mm-hmm. and money that you're paying your lawyers to mm-hmm. kind of work through this foundational process. Mm-hmm. And if after you invest in all that, it doesn't work out, you can't come to an agreement. Now they've got to jettison that whole project and, that, and it can feel like the money was just thrown down the drain because now they've got to hire a different lawyer who's yeah. now got to read into the file and there's costs associated with that. Mm-hmm to then start like a court application. Yeah. And then there's a bunch of money. Like you said, people that go to court are also unhappy with the length of time and the mon- amount of money they spend on it. Yeah. Um, and so I guess that's one criticism I've, I've heard. I don't know if it's criticism. It's just kind of a reality of the situation. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, I, I can jump in there. I think yeah. that's something that, um, well, I know for a fact that this is a conversation that the organization, um, of collaborative professionals is having right now, because certainly we want the process to work for the families that it's going to work for. And if there's a way to identify those, um, situations where it's not going to work for them. We, as an association and as a group of lawyers, I can tell you, don't want to be wasting people's time and money um, on a process that's not going to work for them. The difficulty is, is it's, it's hard. It is hard to predict. I've had um, collaborative files where I thought, oh my goodness, this is never going to get resolved. They're never going to figure this out. And then they do something happens and we use the process and we bring them back to their goals and magic happens and they come to an agreement. But I've also had the flip side where I've taken on broken down collaborative files as a litigator and just cannot figure out why it wouldn't have been resolvable as a collaborative file. So um, it's just a limit of human human yeah. prediction in some ways sometimes. But I mean, I think we all are aware of that and, and do our best to, to pick the right tool out of the toolbox, but it just doesn't always work. When collaborative files break down and go to litigation, though, and I know people aren't feeling this way at that point because you're right, they've got expensive legal bills and now they're facing another new retainer. Um, 
the issues have almost necessarily been narrowed down. So it's not all a waste. It's not all thrown away time. The conversations are had. And I mean, if nothing else, it's been identified then like, okay, we just can't agree on this and we need someone to make a decision. So, um, and I guess, I guess yeah. that kind of is another, um, possible criticism is that if you don't use a collaborative process, there's nothing to stop lawyers from being collaborative, like it, not in that particularly defined way that collaborative law does. But mm -hmm. if, for example, if you and I were on the other side of a file, um, opposite sides of a file from each other, yeah. then we're going to be reaching out to each other saying, Hey, here's what my clients are. Here's the issues as I understand them. This is what my client is thinking. We're yeah. going to be giving our clients advice of like, look, this is what's reasonable. And I'm not going to be asking for something that's unreasonable for you. Mm -hmm. We're going to do something that's backed up by the law and, and the facts in this situation. Mm -hmm. And, um, and where you can't agree through negotiation, you can go to court and it's a little bit cheaper, like having that option in your back pocket. Um, but that's part of collaborative law strength as well, right? Like there's a reason you don't want it to go to be able to just go to court. Yeah. Like I mentioned earlier, that's like, uh, it removes the pistol from anybody's hand that they would yeah. use to point out the other person's head as a negotiation tactic. Yeah. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. um, I've got something yeah. to add on this process. From, from an outside party who was invited into the legal world, what, what, I, what I thought was extremely fascinating when I started working through the courses of mediation, interest-based negotiation, how lawyers work their, their clients through these important questions was how important it is sometimes to have a little bit of time to deal with the, the feelings and the emotions part of the divorce. So things that we'll learn um, or things that I learned, because I'm a solutions person, like I'm in the financial services, we're trying to get things done and move on to the next thing. What I learned was that it is valuable to slow things down and give people some time to process their emotions so they can get the executive function of their brain fired up again and able to make decisions that they're comfortable with and confident with and that they remember participating in. And I think to me, once I started learning about collaborative law, I thought, wow, this is a, this is a huge strength of this program, teaching people how to communicate together, giving people time to take a breath and think about their decisions. And, you know, when I, I don't participate in tons and tons of files, but what I've noticed that's very, I think very welcoming in the process is that the other side's lawyer isn't against you. Whereas that's, that is my understanding in litigation. And I, again, I'm not a legal expert. I don't know exactly everything about everything about the law, but th there is that fairly, you know, welcoming four way meeting happening where you don't feel like the other lawyer is coming at you for, for, you know, your, interests and important things that you're trying to solve. So I just wanted to bring that up because I thought it was really interesting when I was going through those classes. Uh -huh, uh -huh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I just have a couple more questions that I think we should try to get through, but before I, I ask another question, I wanted I did something. I wanted to say something about cost of legal services in general. Cause I think the reputation that lawyers have maybe rightly, I don't know. I don't think so, but let's, but some people may think this is a correct uh, assumption about lawyers is that, you know, we see like a big retainer. We're like licking our chops. Like, yeah. And we don't care about the income because we're getting paid, you know, we're fine. Yeah. Yeah. I'll help you do that. And then we pocket the money, but lawyers are no matter if they're one lawyer at a big firm or solo practitioners, uh, like we are right now, Heather, mm -hmm. regardless, uh, if you want your business to be successful, you can't operate that way. No. Um, I'm, I am not interested at all at taking my client's money for a process. I know is going to fail and that I know they're going to be unhappy with because while it may make me some money short term, I don't want unhappy clients. That is the opposite of a want. I want to serve my clients well so that they're, happy with the process. I mean, sometimes we're, we're faced with difficult situations and you do your best, but 
generally that's, I think that's just important to be said. Every lawyer I've, I've talked to, I don't know any lawyers who have the mindset of, yeah, I'm just going to fleece my clients and, and cause it's a short term, it's very short sighted. Yeah. You're not going to have very many clients if that's how you do things. So I just wanted yeah. to point that out. Like collaborative law is not a scheme to get more money out of people going through a really challenging emotionally and financially challenging time in their lives. It's, it's a process that can really help. You mentioned that it's a re- similar to the cost. And this is one of my questions was going to be like, how much does it cost? How much does it cost to get divorced? Like everyone wants to know how much does it cost to get divorced? Yeah. Um, and if you, I'll give you some time. If you can maybe try to find that on that website that you were saying. Oh yeah, sure. See if you can poke around and find that to give okay. us like what is published on, on uh, the website about that. Yeah. But uh, you were mentioning earlier that to your recollection that they seem to be about the same price as like going through uh, the litigation process or going through the collaborative law process. Yeah. What I think is a really important distinction, whether it's collaborative law or negotiation outside the specific collaborative process Yeah. where both people are involved in coming up with a solution. They're, they're just happier. They're happier with the solution. They feel they have an opportunity to feel heard mm-hmm. when you go to court for a divorce and you're represented by a lawyer, you do not speak in court. You're not like the judge might once in a while ask you something very specific and then tell you to stop talking. Yeah. Um, But most of the time, if you're represented, you do not speak in court. You sit there in frustration on the edge of your seat while your lawyer, just like hoping your lawyer is saying what you're wanting to say right now Mm -hmm. and um, being frustrated with everything pretty much. And then the judge makes a decision they don't know you. That's part of why they're allowed to hear the cases that they don't know either of you or your children or anything. Yeah. They hear like, you know, maybe 20 minutes of submissions from both sides. And if it's regular chambers, if it's special chambers, they'll hear a little bit more. If it's trial, it might hear a couple of days, but your life summed up in at most a couple of days and then you get a decision. And, uh, often surprise, surprise, nobody's happy with it. It seems somewhat, arbitrary or it can. Yeah. And that's not a knock on judges. They're doing their best. No, they are. They're d- yeah. 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 It's just generally the outcome at court. Usually nobody's happy with mm-hmm. the outcome where you're involved in, in making the final decision. People are just, you're just happier with it because you had input, mm-hmm. you were heard mm-hmm. and together you come up with a solution. That's just, that is just better whether or not that's accomplished through the collaborative process or another process. Yeah. Um, it's just better. So if there was no difference between litigation and collaborative law price wise, collaborative law would be the clear winner because you, everyone's just going to be happier with it if they can cooperate through that process. Did you find it? On the I, I have it. No, I, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly though, that there's that, there's that buy-in, right? Like, and I think that can't be underestimated because especially if there are kids involved, you're going to have a continuing relationship with that other person. So it only makes sense to sit down and come up with a solution that works for both of you and for your children. And, um, I think you're right. If we often, when families end up in court and have, um, a third party make that decision for them, our courts are just often not equipped to get to know families as well as they um, might be able to, to make those decisions. So you're right. Families end up with an order or a decision that neither of them really like. And then they find themselves back in court or back in another process soon because it doesn't work for them. Um, so I think collaborative might sort of win in the long game as well. Um, because like Kim said, it helps people practice those communication skills, um, and get communicating, but it also serves everyone's interests as much as possible. Um, so that's going to be an agreement that lasts hopefully. Um, and if it doesn't, then it sets up a precedent for how to solve those problems moving forward as well. So I think that's a really excellent point, Evan, and thanks for bringing that up. Okay. I'm going to look here. Do you have another question in the meantime? We're going to keep um, online. Yeah, I guess I w- I'll just point out that we're kind of, are glancing or like, um, 
scratching the surface of a few things that will be important for us to talk about on later episodes, right? Like all the different options that there are out there besides going to court and kind of what the court process looks like. Because sometimes court is the, is, is the best option, even though uh, I certainly um, rag on it. I certainly talk about how it's the worst, but sometimes it's actually the best because none of the other options are appropriate. Mm -hmm. And we need courts. They're, they serve a really important um, function. Absolutely. Um, and so all this to say, and including like how much does a divorce cost? I think that's like a whole a whole conversation in and of itself where we can kind of help break that down. So we, because I'm, I'm sure people search for this on the internet. At, at least 262.50. Right? That's the filing fee, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Exactly. Um, yeah. So how much does a divorce cost? I think that's something we can get into later uh, on a later episode to like really explore what that looks like for various options. Um, and you just let me know if you find it there, Heather. Yeah. What you were looking for. And then one thing I wanted to kind of like the last thing I wanted to ask is for each of you, and maybe we're going to start with you, Kim, while Heather's looking for something. Do you have any real life examples of how, I know you're only involved, not necessarily for the whole process, but do you have, do you have any real life examples um, that you can share that are positive or like where it's worked well for the people involved in the divorce? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can tell you one, well, for example, this week and really all of, all of the things that I've been involved in when lawyers have pulled me into meetings, it's so interesting and so wonderful to see couples in a room working to solve their problems together. My impression prior to getting involved in collaborative law was that people just fight it out and there's crying and there's tears and there's fear and there's, you know, just a whole pile of negative emotions involved. But the cases that I've been involved with are just, you know, they're quality conversations. People want the process to work. They've got their, you you know, the important things in their heads that they want to solve. And a lot of times it really is focused on the kids and making sure that the kids come out of this in the best possible way. And I just am just so blown away by the couples who are involved, just working to working through this process. And I had a woman this week that I've been working with on her budgeting and just understanding how she's going to be able to afford things in the future. And she's in the collaborative process and we're ch ch chatting a little bit about the meetings and, and the pace that she's going. And I, you know, I'm in the financial services and I'm an imp impatient person have always been really something I try and work on, but I'm really bad at it. And I always feel like things need to be moving faster. And what her take was, was that she was so grateful to be involved in the collaborative process process. And she said, Kim, this is the best thing for my kids. Even if sometimes, you know, it seems like things might be taking a little bit longer. And I mean, what's that in comparison to, right? I mean, litigation can take forever as well, but she just said, this is the right process for my kids. And she had a big smile on her face, even though she was in a challenging situation. And I thought, wow, like, isn't that mature? And isn't that cool that this process is working for her? So all I've seen is a lot of positive things. I mean, certainly it doesn't work for everybody and, and you can never predict what the future outcome is on anything in this world. But the people have just been so amazing and um, just like lovely to listen to in these meetings. Mm -hmm. So that's my, that's my impression of the process. Yeah. I think one of the mottos we like to use is hard on the problem, but easy on the people. So, um, you know, emotions are at the table, but they're part of the conversation and we work through them and we acknowledge them. Um, but it doesn't mean we're not solving the problem. Um, I guess one other misconception that actually just came to me, Evan, was that also, you know, people say, well, we don't agree about stuff. So I don't think collaborative is for us. Um, and I always say like collaborative would be overkill, sort of like what we talked about at the beginning of the conversation. If you agreed on everything, I'd just be drafting a separation agreement for you. Um, it is appropriate where there is disagreement. So it's a process, not a, a, 
an atti attitude, I guess. I don't know what. Um, I hope you know what I mean there, right? So yeah, yeah well, yeah. I, I think so. Like, it, like I can see the temptation to think that. Um, and again, I, I think it just comes from there's not enough information out there readily accessible to people about the collaborative process. Yeah. Um, and so they think, well, I don't feel like collaborating with this person. We can't talk to each other. Right. How would I do collaborative law? It's right. just going to be a mess. Right. Whereas collaborative law um, can be the perfect fit when that is a problem because it can help destroy some of those barriers um, of communication and trust. Well, not destroy the trust, but, but destroy the barrier to trust that's there. Yeah. Yeah. And because, uh, and certainly, um, I'm sure you've had clients, I have clients where they are able to, to agree on everything and they do send me all the information and I just draft an agreement for them. Mm -hmm. And that is definitely the most affordable way to get divorced, but that's just not suitable for everybody. Not everybody yeah. can do that. Yeah. 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 It just doesn't okay. for everyone. So did you, did you find it? Cause we're, uh, it's okay if you didn't. I that's did. Okay. I'm and, but you know, but that's just a good example of how like you couldn't, you couldn't find it. And, and you're a lawyer who's involved in the process and somebody who's just trying to find that information searching on the internet will also not find it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so yeah. that's definitely a topic we'll talk about later. Of yeah. Just yeah. how much these kinds of things cost because yeah. there's a lot of stress when you're getting divorced. It's a super stressful time uh -huh. and it would be nice if we could at least remove the stress of giving you an idea how to prepare yourself financially for what's going to be an unpleasant experience. But having that knowledge is helps remove some of the stress. The unknown creates a lot of stress. Yeah. Okay. I think that's it. Uh, any closing thoughts, anything that you wanted to mention or talk about that we, that we just didn't get to Kim. No, I think, I think we've got a really good starting point here and, and, and it's going to definitely get people thinking about what this process is and whether it's right for themselves. I hope so. Yeah. How about you, Heather? What's your closing thought? Um, I think we've touched on touching on a lot of things, and I'm really excited to uh, future conversations because I think this is a really, a really uh, deep well that we can <laughs> that we can get into for sure. Yeah, I agree. I, it's been a pleasure. Um, th like this is our first one, and we weren't sure how it was going to go. And, um, I've really enjoyed it. I've enjoyed talking to you guys and, uh, and I, I'm optimistic that we can help people demystify a little bit the divorce process and, and other legal challenges. Yeah. Um, so on that note, thanks for stopping in and, uh, we'll talk to you later. Stay tuned for our disclaimer. Bye, Kim. Bye, Evan. Bye, Bye. George. <laughs> Any information in this video is general information only and is not nor is it intended to be legal advice. Watching this video does not create a lawyer-client relationship. You should always seek the advice of a lawyer or other qualified professional for advice regarding your individual situation. While we take care to ensure that the information contained in this video is accurate and up-to-date, we make no warranties or representations as to the suitability, completeness, or accuracy of the information contained in this video. Any reliance you place on the information is at your own risk. Kahane Law Office, Merrick Law, Heather Mallorick Professional Corporation, Evan Clark Professional Corporation, Evan Clark, Heather Mallorick, and any guests will not be responsible nor liable in any way for any content, including but not limited to any errors or omissions in the content, or for any loss or damage of any kind incurred as a result of any content communicated in this video, whether by Evan Clark, Heather Mallorick, or by a third party. Kim McDonald is a financial advisor with Raymond James Limited. Information provided is not a solicitation, and although obtained from sources considered reliable, is not guaranteed. The view and opinions contained in this media are those of Kim McDonald, not Raymond James Limited. Securities-related products and services are offered through Raymond James Limited, member Canadian Investor Protection Fund. Insurance products and services are offered through Raymond James Financial Planning Limited, which is not a member Canadian Investor Protection Fund. Raymond James advisors are not tax advisors, and we recommend that clients seek independent advice from a professional advisor on tax-related matters. Stole my heart from my lips. That was it.